childhood. Right, back to our interview with the broadcaster Liz Kershaw. She's talked about life as a youngster in Rochdale, about writing a column, uh, and about getting her broadcasting break at Radio Leeds. She is now about to go to Radio 1. Well, I did. I had a, br- a tiny break in between because I moved with my BT job to London, so it was the end of my BBC career, uh, and goodbye Radio Leeds. But then I put a tape together of interviews that I'd done, and I got a friend to take it into Radio 1, and um, the two of us started to co-present a show just before the Top 40. I didn't do the Top 40, that was Bruno Brooks. Uh, just before the Top 40, we did a magazine show, half an hour every Sunday and that's how I started and that was pre-recorded and then the next thing I knew um, Janice Long uh, was leaving the evening show on Radio 1 and um, they put me on there and I'd never operated a radio desk myself and I'd, you know, I'd never been on my own on national radio I'd never been live on national radio and I, that was absolutely terrifying yeah, but um, I, I, when once I got it under my belt, I'd got the bug. And, and you were uh, mixing with the rich and famous since. then, weren't you, from the, the oh, rock and roll yeah. scene? And must have been hard to keep your feet in the ground, or or, well, or at least realise, my goodness, I've made it now. Well, it was absolutely as a pop fan um, since I could uh, remember. I was it was absolutely thrilling, and there I was meeting all the people that I'd hardly been able to watch on top of the pops that I'd read about in magazines, whose records I bought. And I was able to do what I'd longed to do when I stood in the audience and watched bands, and that was ask them nosy questions. And my passport to doing that was being on the BBC and being given a microphone to stick under the nose. So you were in your dream job? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And did you then get the fire in your belly to go as far up? Were Were you ruthlessly ambitious in this organisation? Oh, no, I was just glad to be surviving because in those days... I was given contracts, three-month contracts, so I never knew if I'd have a job in three months' time. Um, No, it was just living the life and the hoping it lasted. You were also on air on October the 29th, 2011, when news broke of the death of Sir Jimmy Savile, who at the time was still a much-loved television presenter. Let's have a listen to what you had to say that day. Just before we go, we heard in the news that Jimmy Savile had died. And it's really surreal that, you know, people like that who I'd listened to on the radio, suddenly they were my colleagues because I got this job at Radio 1. And it was very daunting. But I'm so thrilled that, you know, we overlapped with people like that. I've got so many stories to tell. And one day I will. But, you know, weird things went on. No, given what we know now... Did anyone pull you about those comments on air at the time? No, nobody ever asked me what I was on about, no. I really didn't. That day, I, I was under pressure to pay tribute. Um, so many times over the last 30 years that I've been at the BBC, somebody's come running into the studio and saying, you know, so-and-so's died. And as you know, there are procedures to follow. Or if it's a pop star, you say something nice and play a record. And I thought, I really don't want to canonise this guy on air because one day all this will come out and I don't want to be a hypocrite and I don't want to have egg on my face. How well did you know him? I didn't know him well and I didn't know anything about him. What I knew were everybody, uh, were, were people laughing in the pub when I was at Radio 1, um, regaling each other with stories of him out and about in the name of Radio 1 and pulling young girls out of the crowd and taking them into his camper van after and um, all the jokes about that. Also, I was warned not to cross him because he had some very dangerous gangster friends and I was also told that he wasn't the great altruistic charity worker that he portrayed himself to be. Yes, he did raise millions, but he also, if you look at the pictures, was covered in brands and he was he was making a lot of money himself. So basically the message I was given when he arrived at Radio 1 was um, stay clear of him. He's a nasty piece of work. And we, were you given that in, with the benefit of hindsight? And I stress that because it's so easy now to say, why didn't you raise it? Why didn't you? But was it all rumour at that stage? Um, well, when I was told about him taking girls into the caravan, etc., I didn't realise they were underage. I knew they were young. The joke was they were young teenagers. I thought they were, you know, it didn't occur to me. But I just thought that, I thought that was horrible anyway because if you're a late 40s man and you're taking 16-year-olds out of a crowd at a BBC event, 
that's power and exploitation and rather tasteless and dodgy. Um, I didn't know anything to report. I was just told to stay away from him and, and I heard the jokes and, and um, I, I heard people laughing and clinking glasses and I, I just felt on the day that it, was, it would be really unwise to um, sanctify the man. And, of course, the major investigation launched uh, after his death within the BBC, and we've seen all the copy and, and all the commentary uh, around that. And it was around that time that you began to talk about the culture uh, at the BBC uh, uh, at the time, and you said that you were groped by a man within the corporation too. How did he get away with it? Um, because it was a joke, it was it was laughed off. It, jokes were made about it because, as I've said so many times, it was like walking into a rugby club locker room. Um, there were 25 male DJs and four women DJs. And I'm not saying that was an exclusive culture at Radio 1. I think it was an exclusive culture within BBC Radio. I think it was also prevalent in BBC Light Entertainment, which made Top of the Pops. But where, you know, I've, uh, when you... I've been out when I worked for Five Live. I used to socialise a lot with um, football teams, and you'd see, a, you know, get a big gang of blokes together who were highly paid superstars, and and um, you know, girls are throwing themselves at them, and and you'll get you'll get bad behaviour, and you won't you won't perhaps get the best behaviour. I, I, I liken it to that, really. And when it happened to you, did, did, were you tempted to? To go to the police? No, um, I don't see it as um, a criminal act, and I'll tell you why, because I don't think it was a sexual act. It was all about reminding me of my place, and it was all about undermining me on the radio. But you did put in a complaint, didn't you? You say this in your yeah. autobiography. Yeah, I did. I said, I don't, I, I'm sick of this guy coming in and doing that. Uh, you know, it's really un. Um, and what was the BBC's and, response and, and at the time? This is this is this was after it happened. Shortly after it happened, you complained to BBC management, right? Well, I got yeah, I got sick of it happening. It was like, oh no, not again. And um, I, it said, what, <laughs> what's wrong with you, Liz? Are you a lesbian? So I thought, oh crikey! Management the within the BBC said that to you. Yeah, a manager. Yeah. Does that manager still work for the BBC? No. No. I, I didn't see it as a sexual uh, overture in any way. It was simply to remind me that, hey, you're a bird. You shouldn't, you know, sort of uh, the insinuation mean you shouldn't really be on the air. You shouldn't really be doing this, should you, love? You know. Um, so just to put me off my stride and unnerve me, really. And how did Which you it did to some extent, you know. And, how did and you feel, Liz, when you got that response from that BBC manager? I just thought, oh, please. Right, okay, Liz, get on with it. If you want to survive here in this jungle, then grit your teeth, uh, be one of the lads, and um, just know that's par for the course. But I didn't think it was right, and, you know, there were certain people there that I did find... Well, they, they, they set out to make you feel uncomfortable. The then Director General of the, the, the BBC, when all of the, this is post-Savile, uh, was kicking off, the then Director General was George Entwistle, and he asked yeah. to see you in his office. So, completely different context now, uh, when, when he was looking at these allegations about anybody in the BBC, including what you had said. Uh, what, what was it like when he called you into the office, and how seriously did he take it? I had, actually, a lot of time for him. That's the only occasion I met him. And um, obviously, it's quite daunting to be led into the director general's office. I, it, came, it only came about because I'd been invited. I'd been telling people since 1989, so 89, yeah. Um, but suddenly, everybody wants to know about it, and I was a bit bemused, really. But anyway, it came about because I, I was asked to go on the Today program to talk about Jimmy Savile, and I said I can't do that. Oh, well, can you talk about the culture that might have allowed him to operate? So I said, yeah, I can do. So I did that. And then all, all hell's let loose. So I'm led into the Director General's office. Uh, and it, I, I, really li I really respected him. I really liked him. And so finally, some 20 years after this had happened to you, someone was taking it seriously. Yeah, 20-odd yeah, years. Well, 
it's not just about me, Stephen. It's um, I, I what I was saying really was, yeah, yeah, okay. So somebody stuck their hands up me jumper, but there's only there's only one woman doing a breakfast show on BBC Radio. So hello, there's there's still something not right about the way women are viewed in this organisation, George. If you don't mind me saying so. You refused because he asked you who did it. He asked you to name the person and you refused to do so. Yeah. Why protect him? I'm protecting I was supposed to protect myself as well because I, I had no proof and um, therefore I wasn't going to say something I couldn't prove. I believe that's, you know, why we have civil law and libel law. Uh, but also my motivation wasn't to punish or go after a man for something he'd done 20 odd years earlier which but he'd sexually I'd... assaulted you Liz. no it wasn't sexual assault. well someone I'm, sticks their hand up your jumper yeah. i've tried to explain to me though it wasn't a sexually motivated assault and it certainly didn't feel sexual to me it was just bullying in in a personal way which he'd done because i was female and i had breasts but i'd moved on 25 years later i i i just wanted to enlighten him because i'd been asked to do so about what the culture was like when jimmy savile was running a mock you, you, you know and i didn't i didn't want to pick on an individual you know and that that man point, liz is very very lucky because had you have taken a different tack he would probably be in court charged with sexual assault uh he will get his comeuppance one day um i think literally you can liken it to a witch hunt if you think that in the times of the witch hunt in this witch hunts in this country or in north america salem you could simply say i accuse my neighbor or i de i denounce somebody and you don't have to have any proof then that is a witch hunt for instance for instance my my um somebody very close to me witnessed a murder and so I first hand saw the process of that. First of all, if it's a murder or a burglary, you have to establish that a crime has actually been committed with physical evidence. Then you have to find a perpetrator and then you have to prove with CCTV, DNA, eyewitness accounts, circumstantial evidence, the lot, that that person is guilty. I've experienced that first time. The, what Operation U Tree said to me was, oh, we don't necessarily need anything like that. Don't worry about it. So, so Don't you find that shocking? So actually, you're calling into question the, the integrity of the, of the oper Operation U, U Tree process. Not the integrity, not the integrity of the officers. I'm calling to question the wisdom of the Crown Prosecution Service to drag women who I utterly believe have been assaulted into a court with no proof, putting them through that, and then their assailant walking out. What happens to those women now? They're left high and dry. Well, there's, there, there are ups and downs in, in any career, and you've also written in your book about an incident involving a former colleague who went on to commit suicide. A absolute tragedy. Why did you write about it in your book? The reason I put this incident in my book was because I've tried to be very honest in my book about the life of out at the BBC. And I've read so many autobiographies which have been sanitised. And I really didn't want mine to be like that. And also, I'd fought so hard in my contract to get rid of the gagging clauses that have stopped me writing a book for the past five or six years, um, which said you couldn't talk about the BBC or its programmes, its affairs... Blah, blah, blah. That's so taking I, on the BBC. That's a big thing to do. Well, I was told I couldn't write my book in 2007 unless the management vetted it word by word and actually could censor some stuff that I put in. So a couple of years ago, I refused to sign my contract and I went in for six months without being paid because I wouldn't sign up to these uh, what I call gagging clauses. Anyway, it's good to long story short, Tony Hall... He announced last year, I'm not having gagging clauses in my contracts and I want all BBC contracts, the gagging clauses to be taken out. I want people at the BBC to be able to speak openly about their experiences of working there so we can all learn from it. So having thought that, I then thought, right, well, I've got the green light now for a candid autobiography, so it would be hypocritical for me to be self-censoring. Um, so that's why I put in a, a very tragic 
episode in my life in local radio. Can I can I ask you about when we were talking there about the BBC? Because I, I, I really should have asked you, do you think the culture has changed now? I've never experienced a culture like that since Radio 1. Uh, from Radio 1, I went to Radio 5 before it became 5 Live. And that was there were a lot of women there working as producers and in all roles in production and management. The controller was a woman and it was a completely different culture to the extent that I felt quite sorry for some of the guys there because they were a bit henpecked. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to Five Live, which was which I was you know, really pleased because they shut down the old five and I was one of the people who Jenny Abramsky took on for a new station. So, you know, I'm pleased it's done so well and happy birthday five live after 20 years um and she was a formidable woman jenny abramsky a real matriarch and there was you know there, there was there's no suggestion of any sort of sexism uh, or that old-fashioned 70s disco culture or pirate ships or swinging 60s london there and um i've never experienced it in my 12 years at six music or in bbc local radio in the workplace i'm not talking about the number of women on air etc but that that uh, that culture of rampant sexism it was unique to radio one in my 30 years at the bbc and let's talk about five live then because it is our, our 20th anniversary and you've 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 seen and heard uh, the station evolve over the years how, how do you reckon the change has, has gone down for the better or not and you can be honest Oh, yeah, I think, when it, I mean, it was put together in a hurry. That's as a matter of record.